Pat, should we start? Let's do it. All right, hi everybody. I'm Lori Dawson and uh, along with Meetup co-chair Sherry Gray and the board, I welcome everyone. Uh, if you're not a member of the League of Women Voters, we invite you to join us. You can go to our website and click the red join button to find out information. Uh, I wanna give much appreciation to our board who meet monthly to consider and make decisions for our league and also work with our members on committees doing the work of the league. Board meetings are open to all league members and they're held the first Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. So I uh, encourage folks who are interested to come to a board meeting. They're being held currently virtually. So you can uh, reach out by email at uh, president at lwvsaratoga.org to receive the Zoom link to attend those board meetings. I wanted to let everybody know that the nominating committee has begun their work putting together the slate of candidates to be elected by the membership at our annual meeting in June to the board. Suggestions for nominees for the committee to consider are welcome from all league members. You can con contact any member of the board. We will also be sending out an email announcement and there'll be a notice in the newsletter about it. But any of the uh, nominated committee members can be contacted. That is myself, uh, Stacy Lemo Lemodi, Joanna Lasher, Susan Ransom, and Quincy Renee. Our contact information is in the membership list. A reminder to check our website for all of the events that are coming up. Uh, we have a great website. Chris Alexander does a great job of keeping everything up to date and we really appreciate that. And also look for our email announcements that Linda McKinney sends out for us. And uh, you should, you'll get those into your inbox. Our monthly meetups are a way for us to come together to explore, understand, and advocate for issues that matter to us. They are focused on our members and their interests. Meetups are open to all, so feel free to invite others to join us. They generally are held the third Wednesday of the month unless otherwise noted. And again, you'll get notices about everything by email. Okay, so uh, a reminder about our Zoom registration agreement. Let's all give our full attention to our speaker and welcome different viewpoints, different points of view without judgment. Let's all stay muted unless called on to speak and give space for others to talk before speaking again. Please enter questions you might have in the chat and we will monitor the chat and Mark will either respond in the moment or at the end. So I'm now gonna turn this over to Pat Nugent who is heading up the Women's Rights Awareness Campaign and is also the person who organized tonight's meetup, Pat. Thanks, thanks Lori. And thank you to all 42 plus people who are attending this, this evening. Um, it's, I, I'm so grateful to Mark for agreeing to present to us on such a challenging and yes, disturbing issue. Since you all registered in advance, you got to see his bio, but I need to confess, I've screwed it up a few times. I keep saying he and his wife, Katie, moved here from Virginia. They moved here from North Carolina, and he's been very gentle with me about um, insisting he, he moved here from Virginia, but he did have roots in Virginia, so I wasn't totally off. And I believe these Southern roots most likely helps explain their passion for this issue as well as his deep understanding of it. And I know he plans to tell us more about he grew, how he grew into the right to talk about this. I first discovered Mark as a fellow volunteer instructor at the Academy for Lifelong Learning. I noted his courses focused on the oppression of women and on the oppression of minorities. Most of the league's advocacy is centered on oppression as well. So it's appropriate that we're meeting to discuss this on Susan B. Anthony's birthday. 
you guys see my, I'm wearing her face on my t-shirt. There she is. Um, because there's a really strong correlation between the oppression of women and the oppression of minorities in this or in any country. I'm very partial to the name of our organization because it represents our origin story. The League of Women Voters was formed more than 100 years ago to free women from cultural and political organization, from cultural and political structures designed to keep them dependent on the patriarchy. That's also the mission of organizations like Black Lives Matter, freedom from systemic oppression. So although I love our name, the League of Women Voters, we could be called the League of Access for All. Access to voting rights, access to civil rights, reproductive rights, housing, employment, education. We advocate for all these rights for all people. But we were birthed from women who said enough is enough. If that's woke, the League of Women Voters is woke or at least we're getting there. If you've seen the movie Till, you witnessed a woman, a mother, determined to get justice for her son's heinous murder in Mississippi in 1955. Yet, it took 67 years after that for Congress to pass the Anti-Lynching Act just last year. The movie heightened my sense of the intersectionality of the issues that bond women and minorities. I watched that movie through my fingers. We can look away, but should we? Mark will tell us why it's imperative that we don't, because none of us is free when one of us is chained. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Pat. Thank you all for being part of this discussion. And I, I want you to feel free to raise your hand and raise hell and realize that it's an impossible task for me to cover everything in the complete detail that it merits. But So I'm going to present images of American history and I want you to just be aware of these things. And many of these things you are familiar with. For instance, this gentleman on the screen is an imposing, fierce looking, handsome man. I don't know if you know that he had, I believe hundreds of photographs. I know he had a large number of photographs taken during his lifetime. And so as a younger man like this, and as, uh, as an older man with white hair and so does any, well, I'm not gonna ask questions. I'm gonna tell you why he did this. Because at that time, the images that were portrayed of black or African-Americans was as apes or as cartoon characters. And, you know, the Jim Crow is a character uh, in minstrel shows. And Frederick Douglass realized that he was handsome and that he could look mean as hell. And he didn't want people to think of black people as unintelligent and comedic figures. He wanted them to be reckoned with. And so he he consciously did this. He, he sat for photographers over and over again. And if you think about 19th century photographer, when you sit for a photographer who does the uh, flash in the pan type photography, you have to sit there for several minutes. So it, it was not an easy thing to just have a snapshot done or a selfie with his uh, iPhone. Okay, enough of that. The other bit, um, image here on this first page is a plantation police badge from Georgetown County, South Carolina, 1858. And so this is really sort of the roots of the U.S. Marshal Service because slave um, police or, or the slave patrols were deputized into 
uh, enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. And so uh, our, the roots of our American police departments come from the slave patrols. I will just go from there. Okay. Uh, as Pat mentioned, uh, my wife and I both grew up in Virginia, so we got a healthy dose of, or unhealthy dose of Virginia history. We had to take it three times in the course of 12 years of school. And um, so any person who's taken Virginia history knows that this is, of course, Bacon's Rebellion, which was one of the first American revolutions. And uh, so the gentleman with the... Uh, um, yellow sash and uh, rakish hat is Nathaniel Bacon, and he rebelled against the gentleman on the steps there, who is Governor William Berkeley, the colonial governor. This occurred in seven, uh, 1676, so approximately 100 years before the American Revolution. And um, Bacon was able to um, form an alliance of disaffected people who uh, wanted the governor to chase the Native Americans, indigenous people out of Virginia. And the governor had his own reasons for keeping them nearby, partly because they were his allies and, and he wanted the information that they had about other tribes. And so Governor Berkeley refused and uh, Bacon and his uh, cohorts um, rebelled and nearly overthrew the government, the colonial government. Um, in the long run, Berkeley was recalled to England, which was a pretty disgraceful thing. The uh, revolutionary thing about this alliance was that in spite of what you see in the picture, there were African Americans and whites and frontiersmen who were generally white involved in this alliance. And um, at that time, there were free and enslaved and indentured Blacks in this coalition. So that was one of the reasons that it was so successful. And it took so long for the, uh, the British Navy primarily to uh, restore order in Virginia, which was a major uh, income provider to the empire. And um, so this, this was a, a serious um, upset to the power elite in Virginia. And so they eventually uh, decided that they needed to develop a caste system that would break up this alliance. And of course, the obvious way to do that was by separating Blacks from the other groups and so that they would not have common interest and, and be allies in uh, activities like this. So that's that's where the definition of race really came in. And one of the ultimate uh, ends of this was that there were um, several slave codes that were enacted by the House of Burgesses um, and they uh, were culminated around 1705. They were called the Slave Codes of 1705. And so they, they basically said that blacks would not be indentured, that they would be um, enslaved forever. And so they, they were cut off from the, uh, the other people with whom they might have common cause. This is um, a map of the uh, slave owning households, uh, looking at the counties and the states that eventually became the Confederacy, although there are states that stayed in the Union too. Um, and so in just looking at this, um, this grid of all of these counties, uh, you will notice that they go from red to white or gray. And dark red means that 90 to 100% of the households in those counties own slaves. Um, in the course of working on my genealogy, I discovered that one of my ancestors, my great, 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 great grandfather, owned 11 slaves in Haywood County, North Carolina. I was um, really turned off of doing genealogy work after that. Manifest destiny is the idea that when 
America was discovered by Columbus and the Europeans showed up, that the continent was waiting for us to take it and civilize it and make it something because there was nothing really there. And, and so this is what drove the Mexican War, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, Civil War, and, um, and the Transcontinental Railroad. And so this is a famous image that many of us have seen. And of course, you see a Conestoga wagon, you see a st stagecoach and a train, and, and you see a Pony Express rider. And then over here on the left side, you see a dark corner and you see some people and maybe some animals that are heading into the darkness. And those are Native Americans. So those are the people who manifest destiny um, basically ignored and said, these are people who have to go. We, we need to take this country and make something of it because they, they're savages. And, and again, this is white nationalism. And again, it goes all the way back. So you know, when we talk about the roots and the rise, it's been here all along. It, it, it never really went anywhere. Now, the first group that was uh, excluded from uh, coming to America was the Chinese. Now, there were, there were other groups that were excluded of being citizens, but the Chinese made the mistake of coming to California primarily to participate in the gold rush. And uh, they worked hard and they, they did whatever needed to be done. And so uh, they were uh, not appreciated by the people, the, the white people who were uh, gold miners. And uh, so they, they realized that they wouldn't do well in the minefields because uh, there, there were several massacres of, of Chinese prospectors. So they started working in support industries like Chinese laundries and restaurants. And that, that worked out pretty well. But as the gold rush panned out, so to speak, um, the Transcontinental Railroad was coming along. And, and so the Chinese um, saw this as an opportunity and the railroad um, owners saw this as an opportunity to get cheap labor that worked extremely hard. And so these Chinese workers here are in the snow in the Sierras and, uh, and they are one of the main driving forces behind the creation of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, for their labors, they were attacked by the white settlers and the white uh, business interest in California and in the West. And they were uh, the victim of the exclusion acts that began um, in the 1880s. Uh, the, the primary act was in 1882, and it was in, um, reenacted over several times. Uh, a lot of times bills would be enacted by Congress and they would be limited in their time and then they would be reenacted and eventually they'd become permanent. And that's what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So, um, oh, also the picture that I didn't show is the picture of the golden spike where uh, the uh, victorious uh, and, and triumphant uh, railroad workers and, and uh, engineers are meeting uh, north of Ogden, Utah. And uh, if you look at that picture, you can look it up and you'll see that there are no Chinese or any other um, minority workers in that group. And I believe there were black workers and, and possibly uh, Latino workers too. But the Chinese are recognized as having been one of the main success points for getting that railroad built. And uh, many of them died in the very hazardous work that they were involved in. <clears throat> this is the Carlisle Industrial School in Pennsylvania. And these are um, Native American children who were taken from their families and really never returned. And the purpose of these schools, which also appeared in Canada and in Australia, uh, was to take Aboriginal peoples and civilize them. 
And there, one of the um, directors at the Carlisle School was a gentleman named Captain Pratt. And his famous statement was to kill the Indian and save the man. And um, actually several, uh, about 180 bodies of children from the Carlisle School have been discovered in recent years and they are being returned to their uh, homelands. 1916, President Woodrow Wilson showed a film in the White House. It was the first film ever shown in the White House and it was Birth of a Nation. You've probably seen the posters of this and it talks about the valiant knights of the Ku Klux Klan and how they saved the South from sex crazed Negroes. And this is two of the main characters. The gentleman on the left is um, a white actor in blackface portraying Gus, who was a sex crazed black man. And he was after Flora, who is the flower of Southern womanhood. And of course, she's hysterically running away from this terrible person. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me tell you what our president said about this. Um, he said, um, It's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it is all so terribly true. Okay, this is Stone Mountain. It is a uh, sculpture that was uh, begun by uh, Gutson Borglund, who is also famous for doing a sculpture up in South Dakota. And it was a memorial to the brave soldiers of the South. And uh, there actually is a half dollar coin that was minted by the U.S. Mint commemorating Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. I believe that the minting of this coin either skirted the law or actually broke the law about the portrayal of people who had rebelled against the US uh, on American money. Um, the enactment of that, uh, the congressional authorization of that referred to the recent death of Warren G. Harding. And, uh, and so the, the language that enacted this uh, was supposedly memorializing Warren Harding, but um, there's nothing on the coin that refers to him at all. And also on the coin, they removed Jefferson Davis because they thought that that was just a little too much that, that many people would uh, react badly to that. So it, on the coin itself, you have Lee and Jackson. So, that was uh, in in the 1920s. The the stone, I mean the um, Stone Mountain coin came out in 1925. By the way, and so now we're into the eugenics period, and so the next several slides will refer to various aspects of eugenics and immigration restriction, which had the uh, it was a a rage throughout the country, not in an angry way, but it was just it was something that just took hold of America, white America, and um, and was a passion that uh, just was, when, when I do my course on this aspect, uh, people will say, well, who who was for this? And, and um, I say, well, it's easier to say who was against it because everyone was for it just about. There are very few people, including the Pope and, uh, and a few other folks who who thought that this was a bad idea, but they were very much uh, very random voices in the wilderness. So what we have here is a, a, a eugenics poster talking about healthy seed and a check to check the seeds of hereditary disease and unfitness by eugenics. And then there's the eugenics and health exhibit. 
Also, we had an organization known as the American Breeders Association, which is now still uh, operating, but it's now focused on horses and not humans. Um, there was also the Better Babies Contest at uh, state and local fairs. And uh, then there was the Fitter Families Contest, which had to do with families that met, met the white American ideal. Terms were uh, used that we don't consider to mean the same thing now that they did back then, but one was Native Americans. At that time, Native Americans were not people who were indigenous people in, in this country before we came. They were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. True Americans is another term that was thrown around a lot. Um, this, this is something that I think very few of us heard anything about in our history classes, but this uh, went on for many years and we had a very strong collegial relationship with our German brothers and sisters. Um, and they learned quite a bit from us. Uh, one of the things they learned was that uh, the Jim Crow laws in the South were a terrific way to ostracize and to control minorities that they felt were inferior. And so um, all the way up until 1939 and actually even 1941, our, um, our eugenics researchers were involved in very strong collaborations with their Nazi um, peers and colleagues. So we already have had one movie about uh, racism and about uh, the horrible uh, minorities that were inferior and a threat to our society. This is a, a movie that's called The Black Stork and some of you may have heard of it. It's a, it was by a Dr. Harry Hazelden who had been um, called to a care for an infant who had just been born and the infant had um, a missing ear and had um, some other deformities that um, Dr. Hazelton diagnosed as being uh, making him unfit for life. And so he allowed the child to um, just die. Uh, it took about five days, but uh, he, he was asked to treat the child and some of his colleagues said that he really needed to. And he said, no, I won't do that. And he had actually, this was not the first time that he had allowed a child to die when he felt that they uh, were unfit. So The Black Stork is a movie, and um, he actually starred in the movie himself, and he was quite a character. And uh, so there was a huge debate about the ethics of this. The uh, Chicago medical examiner uh, reviewed the case and felt that Dr. Hazelton had been um, totally wrong, but uh, there was no uh, movement to stop him from, from this activity. So now they, on the right, we have a gentleman holding his son and he's pointing at a baby in an incubator and the nurse is caring for that baby. And this is a display that appeared in Coney Island. It was a sideshow and it was an amazing uh, event that um, the doctor who was holding the boy was actually probably not a doctor, but he was a brilliant uh, inventor and he invented these uh, incubators that allowed these premature babies to be um, cared for. And he created a sideshow that charged a quarter a piece. The babies were taken in and they, the families were never charged. And over the years, this sideshow um, saved the lives of hundreds of premature babies. And his name is Dr. Martin Cooney, and he is considered the father of neonatology. And there are, there are stories about this. It's a, it's a really heartwarming story. The nurses were uh, all extremely well-paid and they were very professional. Uh, it's possible that Dr. Cooney learned his medical skills from his wife, who was one of the nurses. It might be the woman in the picture, but I'm not sure. 
moving along. As part of the eugenics craze and the uh, focus on white America, uh, the Congress had been working on restricting immigration because all of these inferior races were coming into our country. And so and um, the next restriction act was the Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. And so what we have here is 1923, we have the waiting room in Ellis Island, and uh, it's full, it's uh, standing room only. And then in 1925, it's the same room. And there may be 20 or 25 people there, I'm not sure. But the what happened was that the Congress uh, created an act that imposed quotas on any of the countries that were considered undesirable, which would have been Eastern and Southern Europe. Any countries that uh, any Jewish refugees were also considered undesirable, regardless of where they came from. Quotas were imposed, and the thing that Congress did that was really uniquely diabolical was that they referred back to the immigration quotas. They, they set the quotas based on the census of 1880. Now, this is 40 years later. But by doing that, what they did was to set the quotas prior to the huge wage of immigration that occurred from 1880 forward. So uh, this is uh, an act that went on from 1924 to 1965. It also resulted in the Voyage of the Damned, which is a movie. Uh, it was a blockbuster. I think James Mason and some other big stars were in it. This was about a, a ship full of Jewish refugees trying to get out of Europe. And they went to Cuba. For some reason, they were told that they could find asylum in Cuba, but they, that was not true. And, uh, and then they went to uh, the US to Florida and were rejected there. So they had to return to Europe. And so this is, is um, an example of what this Immigration Restriction Act did uh, to people who were desperately trying to save their lives. These two women are Carrie and Emma Buck. Emma is Carrie's mother. And Carrie was the um, plaintiff in a trial that went to the Supreme Court, and it had to do with the involuntary sterilization of feeble-minded women, primarily white women, although involuntary sterilization was a huge part of eugenics and of white nationalism in working on trying to eliminate inferior uh, populations. The bottom line is that Carrie Buck was betrayed by her legal team. They told her that they were defending her against this effort to sterilize her when actually they were collaborating with the Virginia authorities who were trying to get a sterilization law that would be um, challenge proof. And so this was another example of someone being taken advantage of in very many ways. The question may come up, people will say, well, was she really feeble-minded? And the answer is no. Uh, if you look at her records, uh, her school records, she was an average to good student. Uh, also, she wrote many letters to one of the doctors with whom she was, uh, she was contesting for some reason, she wrote to Dr. Bell, the, the doctor that was involved in the court case. Her letters are very um, thoughtful. They're very well written. And it's obvious that she was a very uh, capable person. She was not uh, a brilliant genius, but she was very uh, successful in her later life except for the fact that she was never able to have children. However, she had one child before she was sterilized, and that child was judged to be, um, well, in school, the child was on the honor roll. And unfortunately, she died of a, of a disease uh, at about seven years of age. But this is a uh, 
well cataloged in several books about the Buck v. Bell case. And of course, the great jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., in reading the court briefs, which of course didn't really give any evidence that this person was in, in any way uh, deserving of being sterilized, although it's hard to tell who would be deserving of that. Um, he said, uh, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And she was referring, he was referring to Carrie, her mother and her daughter. Um, I had always heard that he was a great jurist and um, apparently uh, that's not correct. Uh, so we're talking about how you can um, challenge someone who um, is a front runner for the presidential nomination. And uh, so we have two examples here, one from 1923 or 1920, and that's Warren G. Harding. You can tell that he seems to have Anthony Fauci's propensity for baseball. And uh, he's also a very handsome man. But um, while he was running for president, his opponent charged that he was black. Uh, of course, this was something that would have been a major scandal if it was true. And uh, it was quickly exposed as not being true at all. And uh, the genetics were done many years later, and uh, he was definitely white, although the genetics also showed that the woman who he was having an affair with did have a daughter, and that was his daughter. On the right, we have uh, the birth certificate of one of our presidents, and um, of course, the birther movement uh, brought this up, that this is not a valid birth certificate, and, and um, I'm not really clear on why it's not valid, but um, apparently there were a lot of people who thought so. And then in 1942, after the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor, the Ise and the Nisei, uh, Japanese Americans, many of whom were citizens, were taken to internment camps in the West and um, and so this is a picture of the Boy Scouts at one of these camps on parade. And um, many of these Boy Scouts within a year or two were going to be old enough to join the 442nd, no, I think it's 242nd um, Infantry, which was the all Japanese uh, unit that was one of the most highly decorated in World War II. Uh, and they, of course, had to leave their family and friends uh, back in these camps while they were fighting and dying in Europe. The article is from Seattle, and it's uh, basically the Army made a determination in about 1943 that uh, the people who had been interned represented no threat to our country and that they could return to their homes in the, on the coast. And, and so that ban was lifted. And this um, newspaper is asking, what do you say? And the um, letters to the editor are saying, no, we don't want these people to come back because our boys are out there fighting the Japanese and, and we don't want these Japanese families returning to our our city. So again, this is, is one of those environments where you, you see all of this. And there are so many examples of how we have been very consistently cruel and brutal to people who look different from us and came from other places. Uh, I will talk about some of the things that I've had to do just to maintain my mental health and and not to be totally depressed about this and uh, there are some surprising sources that have been very helpful <clears throat> uh, one of my career um, phases involved the work that i did with the protection of human research participants and so i'm very familiar with the tuskegee study the syphilis in the negro male and I'm also aware of the Nazi doctors and, and the Nuremberg trials. And so 
what I've put here is a contrast between a woman who was a victim of the Nazi doctors at Raven's Book concentration camp and the women who were uh, in, involved in these um, experiments were known as the rabbits of Ravensbrook because their legs were severely damaged and they had to hop everywhere. And they were also called rabbits because rabbits were lab animals. Out of the Nuremberg trials was uh, the first ethical code for the uh, humane treatment of people involved in research. And of course, informed consent and voluntary participation were two of the primary uh, tenets of this code. One thing that people may not know is that the Nuremberg Code, although it was developed with the cooperation and, and um, as a result of the trials that were uh, led by the allies, and of course the Americans were very much involved, the Nuremberg Code was never enacted in the United States because we didn't need it. However, from 1932 to 1972, the US Public Health Service was engaged in the syphilis trial that not only allowed these men who are not being pictured to be infected with syphilis and to follow the natural course of syphilis, which is an insidious disease and and many of these men died of complications of late syphilis, but also the men who were involved in the trial were not treated, but also their families were not treated. And so many of their partners were uh, infected with syphilis and their children. And so this was, uh, unfortunately, a large part of my career was at CDC, and CDC had an opportunity in 1960 when they were merged with the Bureau of VD Control, part of the National Public Health Service, uh, at, which was a, an agency that was in Washington, D.C., and CDC was in Atlanta. They were merged, and the research portfolio was shared with the CDC uh, officials, and they reviewed the syphilis trial and they had the opportunity to say, this is unethical and we need to stop it. It's, it's a horrible uh, abuse of, of these people. And um, CDC consistently made the wrong decision. And so uh, for another 12 years, the trial went on and these men continued to be exploited. Uh, this person's having his blood drawn and they were also doing spinal taps and they were presenting this to these uh, men as treatment. The spinal tap was treatment. Um, I've had a spinal tap and uh, I would never mistake it for treatment. Um, one of the landmark cases in racial segregation, and really the landmark case, is Plessy versus Ferguson, the separate but equal doctrine that was implied, uh, imposed by the Supreme Court. And this gentleman who's sitting at a table outside a classroom where he's a student is named George McLaurin. He applied to Oklahoma State University to be a student. He su was successful in his application and Oklahoma State decided that they would implement a program to allow him to attend classes, but not to be involved in any way with the white students. So he was segregated within the university. And so he's sitting outside the class. You notice none of the students are looking at him. He had a study area in the library that was uh, surrounded by a wall of newspapers, piles of newspapers around his um, work area. And so that would enable the, uh, the other students to not have to look at him. He applied when he was 61. He got his uh, degree and he ended up as a college professor at Langston University in Oklahoma. And um, his court case went to the Supreme Court in 1948. And in 1950, the unanimous Supreme Court decreed that the treatment he received was not equal. And therefore, 
this was the first direct challenge to Plessy versus Ferguson that succeeded. And so he is almost the first pioneer of the civil rights movement uh, at this time. Uh, many who, of you have heard of redlining. This is Brooklyn. This is a map of Brooklyn. You can see Prospect Park, Greenwood Cemetery, Kings County Hospital. My wife and I lived in Brooklyn for uh, two years, and um, we did not live in a red area. The red areas are areas that are considered uh not good for real estate values. And the primary criterion there is that there are minority populations in those areas. Uh, however, when I was working in the uh, New York City Health Department, uh, I was working in those red areas, but some of those areas would be Crown Heights, Bedford Stuyvesant, East New York, Brownsville, and uh, I'm not sure what others, but, but uh, Greenbush, and um, it, so it's it's a perfect example of how the Federal Housing Authority and the VA Housing Authority um, perpetuated the segregation of Blacks and uh, the white flight to the suburbs uh, by making it almost impossible for Blacks to buy homes that would be um, likely to be able to be sold uh, at a profit. And so this, this is another example of how the federal government um, created, prob, uh, created programs that would help white Americans, but they were organized in such a way that the Black Americans who tried to take advantage of them, and of course, this, this is not the first example. The first example would be the New Deal uh, and many of the New Deal programs applied only to whites. For instance, Social Security excluded domestic workers and farm laborers. And so a large part of the uh, Black population would fall into those categories. And so they didn't get Social Security. Uh, and then there was the GI Bill after World War II. Again, the way that the government uh, made these programs available uh, it seemed like it would be available to all, but the way that these programs were implemented was on the local level. And so the people who decided whether you got GI Bill benefits or you got a, a federal mortgage were in the localities. And of course, in the South especially, the, you, your chances of getting these benefits were slim and none. Mark, there's a question about what year this map uh, represents? That's a great question, and I don't know. Um, but I'll look, I'll look at it. I'll, I'll figure it out. I probably could find this picture again from Google and, and find out, but um, I would say that it's, it's pretty old. Now, when I was working there, I started in 1978, and um, it, it looks about right for when I was there. Uh, it, it may have, have been quite a bit before that. One thing I would say is that um, a lot of these neighborhoods are now gentrified, which is a polite way of saying that whites have moved back in and, and uh, they become unaffordable for minorities uh, who used to live there. And so for instance, Crown Heights, I know that there are a lot of young urban professionals living in that area now. And uh, I lived in Park Slope, which was a nice neighborhood when I lived there and is still really nice. But uh, but I would say that this might be from the 50s or, or 60s. I, I would say maybe the 50s, but I'll, I'll look on, um, I'll see what I can find on that. Oh, by the way, I'll have a, a bibliography and some links that I've been using as references, including some videos uh, that, that go into more depth than I could ever do in this uh, presentation. This is Norview High School. I actually uh, 
had a teacher for my father. One, one of the history teachers was my dad. And uh, this is about the time he was teaching there. It was 1958 and 59. And that was the year that uh, the bird machine in Virginia decided to have massive resistance to the order to desegregate the schools. So Norview High School and all the high schools in Norfolk, Virginia were closed because Norfolk had decided that they were going to integrate according to the court orders. And in Virginia, there were many localities that said, we won't integrate, we will have segregation academies, which are still in effect, are still in existence in, in uh, Virginia, throughout Virginia. But these segregation academies were set up primarily by churches, and they were set up to um, allow white students to continue their education. And there were no similar provisions made for uh, black students. Uh, and they were just deprived of education. Um, the bird machine controlled Virginia uh, and made some good changes. For one, uh, my parents were both educators and the teachers uh, retirement program and the teachers benefits in Virginia were pretty good. And so my parents benefited from that. Although at this time, my dad was looking for a job because he wasn't teaching. And he actually did teach in one of the segregation academies for a, a period of time. I'm not sure how long. Um, but then this is the Norfolk 17. And these are a famous group of African-American students who agreed to integrate the schools. And, uh, and then massive resistance occurred. And so they were uh, unable to attend those schools because they were shuttered. But uh, these, these are people who eventually were able to uh, participate in integration and went on to complete their education. And um, some of them are still alive. And um, so it's, it's an interesting story. Norfolk tended to be somewhat of a rebel within Virginia because it was a little more diverse. It was a big military uh, area. The um, Navy, the Air Force, the Army were all in that area. And uh, so you had a lot of diversity. You had people coming from other countries to join the military, and you had uh, a lot of diversity within the population. It was about half black and half white for most of the time that this, uh, this struggle was going on. Uh, this gentleman in black and white is James Reeb. He was a Unitarian minister who was um, beaten to death with clubs by uh, white men in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, he was actually working as a civil rights activist, and uh, they were attacked on their way back from dinner, and he had suffered severe head injuries. He was taken to a... Uh, Blacks only hospital in Montgomery, and he uh, his injuries were too severe; they couldn't treat him. Uh, so uh, it was decided to take him to Birmingham, which is quite a distance from Montgomery, and he died on the way. So um, there were three men who were uh, indicted for his uh, murder, and they were acquitted by all white jury. Uh, the gentleman who's uh, sitting in his easy chair is Bill Portwood. And uh, there had been an investigation within, I think about the last five or six years that NPR and uh, private investigators uh, determined that there were witnesses who had heard the three men who were acquitted uh, uh, proudly announced that they had killed him, that they had killed Reverend Reeb. And this gentleman named Bill Portwood was contacted because the, one of the witnesses said, yeah, Bill was involved too. And the witnesses were reporting that they had been told by the actual men that they had participated in this and they were proud of it. Bill Portwood's answer to questions about this was, oh, well, I just kicked one of them. Uh, he died within a few weeks of, of his interview. But uh, this is something that I haven't really talked much about lynching. 
uh, we we know about this. And one thing to remember is that the um, the Equal Justice Initiative opened a me memorial in 2018 in Montgomery, Alabama. It's the Lynching uh, Memorial Museum. And I would highly recommend going there at some point. I have not been able to get down there yet, but I expect to. And uh, it's a very moving experience. Uh, one of the things I try to do is to avoid just really focusing on the how how horrible and how brutal people can be. Yes. Um, one thing I have to say is that there is a secret to my success, and that is that I married well. Uh, the Brooklyn Red Line map is from 1938. So um, my wife and I collaborate on our courses. She's my fiercest critic, and she's pretty biased in my favor, too. So thank you, Katie. This is Fannie Lou Hamer, another of my heroes. Fannie Lou Hamer was given a Mississippi appendectomy. So Carrie Buck was sterilized. Fannie Lou Hamer was sterilized, and she was never able to have children. She wanted children desperately. She did adopt two children with her husband. But Fannie Lou Hamer is famous for raising Mississippi out of complete white dominance, white segregation. In the 1960s, she was a, um, an activist and she and Robert Moses founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the Mississippi Democratic delegation in the 1964 Democratic National Committee because Mississippi was at least 40% black at that time. And the delegation, the Democratic delegation had no blacks at all. It was completely white. So she challenged their credentials and it enraged LBJ so much that he held a press conference with, he invited 30 governors to this press conference, but the whole purpose of the press conference was to shut her out of television coverage. And so she would have been covered live testifying before the Democratic Committee, but LBJ torpedoed that. This is, of course, the same President Johnson who uh, got the Civil Rights Act passed. And so, you know, we, we have these egos and we have these these uh, people who uh, think that they're doing great service to humanity, but they also want to be completely in charge. And so um, the news media actually uh, figured out what was happening. And so they recorded her testimony. And so instead of it being televised live, which was during the day, it went on the evening news. So her testimony was heard by millions of Americans. And uh, and she is a force of was a force of nature. Uh, by 1972, she was a delegate to the Democratic National Committee in the Mississippi delegation. And in 1968, the delegation was finally integrated. Um, but she was also known for uh, working to help poor, uh, poor families in Mississippi by one of the things that she did was to develop a pig bank. And it, it, this is, is not trivial. What she was doing was helping uh, these families to raise baby pigs to adulthood. And then uh, once they were able to have their own babies, then they could sell the pigs or they could um, use the pigs for meat and, and other um, uh, basic support, basic nutrition. Uh, but Fannie Lou Hamer was uh, only allowed to go to school until, um, well, she went for six years. I think she was, uh, I'm not sure how old she was, but she she was considered illiterate. She spoke like a Southern woman and and was uh, people made fun of her because she was not as articulate as people expected. And 
uh, but what what she had to say came from her heart, and she was uh, was a really powerful force in Mississippi. Unfortunately, she died young of uh, complications of heart disease and breast cancer. And if you look at Mississippi now, they really could use somebody like her again, uh, especially the city of Jackson, the capital, which is 80% Black and has just been uh, forced to accept a white-only court system that is has been imposed by the state government on Jackson. Uh, so uh, again, Fannie Lou Hamer is a name that if you haven't heard of her, you can see, I think on American Experience, there is a, a good documentary about her, but she is uh, one of the real heroes of the civil rights movement. Mark, I'm going to interrupt you for a second because a, okay. a comment that was a heat of the moment comment came in, and I think it's something that you should hear, um, which is from Michael LaBelle. And he writes, as a history major myself, I can say without reservation that this is simply fabulous. Bravo, Mark. So oh, I, now I I'm going to get a fat head. I, I just wanted you to hear it because wherever you were in the process really struck him. So uh, carry on, but thank you. Thanks, Michael. And, and I hope that that's what I'm able to do is just to to share the, these experiences. Was, I was very fortunate in how my life turned out that I was exposed to people of all races, walks of life, sexual preferences. And, and this, this really enriched my whole understanding of humanity. And I'll put in a few plugs for some of the books that have just given me a lot of hope. Uh, and of course, this is one of the most hopeless scenes that I could ever imagine. And uh, this is, of course, the Jews will not replace us, torchlight parade in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I'm not going to show the picture of Heather Heyer being killed. It's, it's too graphic and it's just too sad. But I think that this is, uh, this is where white nationalism has been. And it's important for us to keep in mind that it's, it's not gone anywhere. Um, and I do have a few thoughts about what are we going to do about it, which I hope that I'm going to get more thoughts from you, because I just have a few ideas that are based on the reading that I've done, and, and some of the writers are just um, amazing. And of course, this image tears your heart out, but this is a, it's a young boy who is wondering what the heck is he doing and wherever he is. He's probably at the Mexico-Texas border. You can see that his mother has her arm around him, and so he hasn't been separated from her yet. But of course, we know that there are hundreds of children who are still not able to be reunited with their families. And so this is another example of, you want to come to our country, we're, we're not going to let you in, and we're going to be brutal to you, and we're going to take your children away. And it's, it's just the kind of thing that a lot of states, like, well, I don't name names, but there are certain states where you can't teach this type of information because it makes us feel bad. And of course, maybe we should feel bad. Maybe we, we should feel really bad, and maybe we should do something about it. But I'm preaching. I'll stop that. I'm not a preacher. All right, this is the last slide. And uh, so these are these are the words that I promised. Uh, there would be some words in this presentation. So just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, uh, one of my talk, one of the things that I do in my last slide and classes that I um, teach is I usually have the phrase quo vadis, which is uh, from the Bible, and I think it's from Peter. And he said God uh, or said to Jesus where do you want me to go now, Lord? And and um, and so I think that, you know, we get all this information and we, we study and we think about these things, we discuss them, but what are we going to do? Well, um, there are a lot of challenges in our world and a lot of things that, that could end our existence. I mean, climate change could make this the last century of human existence. 
I hate to say things like that because I'm a, a fatal optimist. Uh, but it is important to realize that we do face real threats from diseases, of course, being a CDC veteran. I, uh, I don't like diseases. I've never liked most of them. Uh, and, and so that, that's another thing that, you know, these uh, pandemics are just waiting out there. We are destroying natural habitats and uh, organisms that we've never encountered are coming from bats and other animals that are out in the, in the uh, Amazon or in, in uh, jungles in uh, different places around the world in China. And, and so these are threats to us. And then, of course, there's nuclear war, which is uh, very possible. Again, this is depressing talk. But we as a species need to start thinking, what are we going to do to get together instead of fighting all the time and dividing up into different camps? And, and uh, especially those people who say, well, we don't, we don't care. I mean, we, we're not worried about this. We're not going to worry about minorities who are mistreated and inequities. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that I don't usually talk about other countries because I think that our country has plenty to work on. Uh, but if you talk about white nationalism, you could also talk about Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, Russia, um, and, and several other countries, Hungary, uh, Turkey. I mean, it, there, there are countries where this is a major problem. And you could say, well, we're not as bad as those countries, but I'm not sure that that's accurate. And even if it is accurate, not being as bad as other countries doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of things that we need to work on. So who's going to stand up and, and try to change things? And that, that's one of the things we have to decide, because there are people who deny science and deny the, the suffering of, of people who who need to be empowered and need to be helped to to be equal in in standing with the rest of the population and there are there's a large part of our population that says hell no we're not gonna we're not gonna stand for this it it's not something we care about i saw a car uh going over 87 just several months ago, it was, and it had a handwritten sign in the window and it said, save America. And I was thinking, what is this man trying to say? And I think what he was trying to say is save America from becoming non-white, save white America. And I, I'm just, I'm, I didn't stop him and ask him because I really didn't, I wasn't fast enough, but uh, also, it's, it's important for us to consider that this country claims that we're the melting pot, although there's a lot of criticism of that idea, but we supposedly welcome people from other countries and they've made great contributions and I can catalog them just like all of you can. But we also have to think about confronting our past. And so in talking about other countries, we could talk about South Africa, who has confronted their past. And I'm not in any way saying that South Africa is any better than we are, but at least they have done, uh, been through that process and we haven't, and we've consistently avoided it for 246 years. I also think that one of the things that we could do to make things better is to stop worrying about whether I as an individual am a racist. We need to think systemically that racism in this country is a major part of the structure and the heritage and the cultural framework of who we are. And then we have a picture over here of Calvin Baker, who is a writer in residence at Skidmore. And this is his book, A More Perfect Reunion, and the subtitle is Race Integration and the Future of America. Mr. Baker is a great writer. And this is a terrific book, and I highly recommend it. And his thesis is that we tried integration in the 60s and 70s, and then we kind of turned away from that. And I remember work going to um, 
school and being part of integration strategies, including something called majority to minority transfers. And so I went from that Norview High School that I had a picture up to Booker T. Washington High School. And so I was a majority white student, but also I became a minority at Booker T. 50 years ago, we graduated, and now we're going to have our reunion in September. I engaged with my peers when I was at high school, and when we graduated and went our separate ways, we went our separate ways, and we really didn't have much to do with each other again. Some of my um, African-American uh, friends and and uh, fellow students went to the same college I went to, but most of them went to historically black Norfolk State University, and I went to historically white Old Dominion University. But you've heard that there's a, a saying, why, why do all the black kids sit in the cafeteria together? And, and that was, it, we experienced that reality. And so we, we separated, we, we did white flight, we went to the suburbs, and now it's very hard to interact with people who don't look like us because they don't live where we live. And this is, I'm not just saying in Saratoga, in some cases, Saratoga might be better, but throughout our country, you have um, systematized whites in the suburbs. And of course, there are all sorts of issues related to redlining and, and the housing programs that were developed that um, perpetuated and, and established very firmly the racism that we, we live with now, which means that we don't get to interact with each other as neighbors. The last thing I would say is that if you want to know how to vote, I would say vote for someone who doesn't look like you. Vote for people who may not think the same way you do, but figure out what they do think and, and give them uh, the benefit of the doubt that maybe they have some good ideas based on the things they've been through. And, and I think that um, one, one saying that I, I, I don't know who said this, but it's your 5,000 years are up. And that has to do with white men running everything. And I, I know white men. I, I have had friends who were white men, and I was raised by one. Um, but they can be a real pain. And, and they think they know everything. And uh, if you look at the history of white nationalism, a lot of it came from people who we would consider wise men like uh, Immanuel Kant and David Hume and the Enlightenment philosophers, including Voltaire. And they decided that these people in Africa and Asia and in uh, America, uh, because they didn't look or, or act like us, and, and, and Australia is a terrific example because the Aborigines were considered to be completely barbaric. And that was found to be really wrong. And, and there's a whole story there. I won't get into it. But uh, their, their civilization was not easily classifiable by European terms. But the bottom line, I think, is that if we had more women in Congress, So, uh, the 5,000 years are up was said by Mary Beth Edelson, who is a celebrated women's activist. Of course, she's a troublemaker. But, um, okay. And so, so, what I would say is that if we're trying to decide who to vote for, we want to try and look for people who are going to be somewhat revolutionary because the status quo has not really worked for us. I mean, right now we're in a situation where our Congress is gridlocked and almost guaranteed to get nothing done for another two years. And we have threats, we have issues that we have to deal with and, and, uh, and we need our government to work. And of course, as a former federal employee, I feel that government can do the job, but it, it needs to have the right leadership. And we need people who are willing to think critically and to, to think differently about a lot of the things that we've taken for granted and a lot of the assumptions that we've made. And so um, 
I, I want to open it up, but I also want to point out that there are two people who wrote very well and have really sustained me, and one is James Baldwin. There's a book called Begin Again by Eddie Glaude Jr., and I don't know if I pronounced Eddie's name correctly, but I just took a stab at it. And he wrote about James Baldwin, who was right in the middle of the, of the civil rights struggle. He was uh, friends with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, uh, and he wrote very passionately about what it means to be Black in a world where people hate you. And his writing is really inspiring. He also was involved in a debate with William F. Buckley Jr., which uh, if you watch it, it will just show you how really stupid Buckley was and of how brilliantly Baldwin just wiped him out. It was in front of uh, Harvard a, a group of Harvard students, and and they overwhelmingly said, "Yeah, Baldwin won this debate completely." And uh, but but he's just he has a very compassionate nature. He has a really nice quote that says, "You and I can disagree as long as you don't expect me or you don't respect my right to exist." And and so. It, that's the sort of thinking that that really gave me um, hope. But the other person who has given me a great deal of hope is Rebecca Solnit. And I would imagine that many of you are aware of who she is. She's the author of the book uh, or the essay, Men Explain Things to Me. And uh, while she didn't create the term mansplaining, she wrote about what it is. And um, she's just got fire in her belly. And um, I just finished one of another one of her books. It's called Hope in the Dark. And it's about revolutions and how revolutions occur. And it appears that nothing changes because they don't overthrow the established authority. You don't have something like the American Revolution where we actually did get a country started. Most of the time, those revolutions don't result in visible change. But what happens is that the revolution changes the way we think and the things that we expect of our society. And, and so her point is that the future is dark, which is the way it should be. It should be unknown because we have to create that future. And if it was all clear and we had a bright light shining on it, then we might just say, well, hell, we're just not going to go there. We, we, we can't do anything. But her, her way of writing is incredibly inspirational. And, um, and so she's been a great comfort to me, too, as I go through this. I'll, I'll just tell a quick story. How are we doing on time? We're, we're a little short on time. Um, okay. We said it would end at 830. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we should open it up for questions. But Mark, you need to know that the league is not going to let you get away. Um, I can see bringing you in for the history of oppression of women. I can see the climate, our people in charge of climate change wanting to bring you back. And uh, we hope you and Katie are, yeah, I know you were active in the league in uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. <laughs> I'm hoping you will get, um, get it active with us as well. So if you're okay with transitioning to some questions, in case some people do plan to leave at 8.30. Um, I pulled up the ch the chat, so uh, just tell me what you want me to answer, and I'll, I'll well, give why it don't, I don't. There are not too many questions in there. There are some comments that people can take a look at, but I'm just wondering if anybody wants to raise any questions while we have Mark here verbally. And if so, I think just talk, because I can't see the whole screen. I have a, just a statement. Yes, Linda. <laughs> um, I had read recently that we could have saved Anne Frank if those restrictions were not in place to prevent um, Jewish people escaping Europe. Um, she would have. She would have lived. 
well. Yes, I believe and, that that Leo Frank um, had been negotiating with the U.S. to uh, bring his family to the U.S., but of course, they couldn't. Right. Uh, right. We would we would not let them in. I also wanted to just say because I, I'm on the DEI committee, not just in our league, but also for the the, the league, the New York State Task Force. And a lot, I've, I, I knew a lot of the things you said, but I think because I've just been on a journey myself. And so when you say, when, when one suggests that, you know, like, what do we do in the future? For me, it's like learning, learning all of these things, all the things you presented and also, uh, you know, learning as much as I can about what really happened in our history and also speaking out when I see things happen now, when I see people say things or do things or comment on things that, and I never would have before. I never would have done that before. I was in Georgia, I saw the um, Stone Mountain and I was blown away at that time. I was like, oh my gosh, this is just amazing. But I had no clue as to the history behind it. So awareness to me is just like the key. And I, I must confess that Katie and our son and, and our friends went to Stone Mountain. They had a wonderful laser show there. It ends up with the American Trilogy song by Elvis. And so you've got Dixie and you've got uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and it's incredibly stirring. And those horsemen ride in the laser show. They they ride. It's it's incredibly fun. <laughs> and at the time, I had not really thought about the fact that if it wasn't for the Klan and the United Daughters of the Confederacy and a bunch of racist white supremacists, it, it would never have existed. But, yeah. Mark, let's go back to what Linda said, because um, I think this would be very valuable for all of us. We, I like what you said about really our culture is racist and we play a role in that. But do you have any guidance for us? Because probably every couple of days, if not more often, we run into a comment. Um, something that's that just strikes us as judgmental, racist, whatever you want to call it. Do you have any suggestions for ways to be helpful to that person, not confrontational, but to let them know um, this smacks of uh, looking down on, on someone or whatever? I, I have been reading on another level about um, how do we have these difficult discussions and be constructive? And there are two really great books that have come out within the last few years. One is called Re uh, Think Again. It's by Adam Grant. Uh, it'll be in my bibliography. So I'll, I'll send this out. Hopefully the, the league can just put it up and uh, anyone can... Uh, just see what, what I've been looking through to try and figure out what I was gonna say, which was really unfortunate because I kept reading more and more. And so I had more and more to say and less time to do it. So, um, so think again, and this is about how to think in such a way that you're not preaching or politicizing and think like a scientist is how he characterizes it. And what a scientist does is they assume that they're wrong. And then they try to disprove that they're wrong. But often they do approve that they're wrong. And so they just go on and they try something else. And so that's a very good book. It's an easy read. And he talks about going to Mount Stupid. Well, that's where all the white men hang out. And... Um, and, and so I think that's one of the great books. And there's another book called High Conflict. And it's by Amanda Ripley. And it's about how people get into uh, community meetings, like the uh, city council meeting or the board of education meeting. And they are experts at uh, social work and at, at working through negotiators and 
and mediators and and then they lose it all and they get into these conflicts and they just start behaving very badly and and he has uh, she has some terrific examples of of people who didn't realize how badly they were just throwing away all the tools that they had had developed and and had been successful when they got into a different arena and they thought well I've got to be different and and different was the absolute wrong thing to be uh so okay. there okay. there are a lot of uh books about this because we are dealing with so many controversial issues and we have so many people who um who look at how the dynamics of how we interact with each other. And I will just point out one person who, who had a terrific approach and that was H.L. Mencken. And most people uh, at the time when he was writing had some issue with him at some point in time. And so many people would write to him and say, dear H.L., you are an SOB and you're all this other stuff. And um, his answer to those um, comments was dear sir or madam, you may be right. That was it. Yeah. Period. And so, and again, it's it's. I think, especially with with uh, white men, and and with men in general, that we have to be right. And in our family, we had a tradition of correcting each other. And Katie has been making me pay for that for many years. That we would correct each other at the dinner table and. And it was our behavior that, you know, I'm right. No, no, I'm right. Well, maybe we're all right. Mark, I want to get um, back uh, to a comment that popped up in the chat, because I think it's important. And I think it was kind of said tongue in cheek. But when you say vote for people who think differently than us, I think it's important to uh, put that in context. You want to vote for people who represent your values. But, right. you know, so because the question came up, so should we be voting for white supremacists because we you know, don't think it, you know, I think what you're saying is you still vote your values, but you maybe you vote the extreme of your of your values. Um, well, also, also that you vote for people who have a different take on how we get to our values and we may share values with people but they may have experiences that inform them that the way to get to those goals that our values drive us toward is completely different. And especially as you're getting younger people into the public uh, discourse and into politics, you're gonna have people who don't think like boomers and they don't think like Gen Xers and they think like themselves. And so, we want to be listening. One of the things that I do is I, I don't watch TV news. I do watch PBS. I do listen to NPR. And I do uh, look at journal articles. I also look at the Atlantic Monthly. And in spite of their eugenics past, I, I forgave them a while back. They have columnists who write really well. And they provide me with insights to things that I don't uh, understand and I, I never experienced. And, and one in particular is a young Black man who grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, and he talks about what's new and what's cool and trends in, in our modern society. And it's really helpful to have somebody like that to guide an old, feeble person like me. <laughs> um, but so but in the last minute or so, does anybody want to say anything? Well, we have Mark present. Just shout it out. I can't see everybody on the screen because we had almost 50 something people here. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I put a question or, or a comment kind of in the chat, which was challenging. Mark, you mentioned very early on in your talk that although you had found out that your family in the past had been slave owners, you didn't really want to know more about it. And I know a number of people who, when they found out that their families were slave owners, have gone out of their way to find the descendants of those slaves and have had regular get togethers with them, are putting the descendants of those people through college, all kinds of things as sort of a personal approach 
to reparations, but there are, are several great organizations that are actually facilitating dinner conversations to put extended families that are part black and part white back together and um, some really interesting, exciting genealogical work that's being done. And it just seems to me that given your um, concerns in these areas, you might want to explore your your personal family thing as a way of doing some healing about it. I actually was uh, in touch with a group in Raleigh that um, I think it's room at the table or it's something to do with getting to the table. And it's for people whose ancestors were slave owners. And uh, one of my dear friends invited me to go there, but um, I, I went through some serious medical issues and then I we, we moved up here. But I'm aware of those organizations and I am interested. One of the things that was really disappointing in my um, getting my DNA tested was that I was as white as white could be. And I just was very disappointed. I thought that some of my ancestors might have intermarried with the Cherokee or with um, African Americans, but it was it was disappointing to me. And in my experience in the schools, uh, there were people named Long who I might be related to. They may be cousins. And I I am interested in knowing that. I, I haven't been working on genealogy because of other things, but um, but I definitely would like to know if there are people like the Hemings family to the, the Jefferson descendants. And so I, I think that's a very good point. And um, I'll, I'll see what I can find out. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Laura, you want to bring it home? All right. Well, that was fabulous. Thank you so much, Mark. That was wonderful. And I'm looking forward to getting the bibliography. I was looking things up <laughs> while you were writing and we'll put up, we'll definitely be able to put them on our website. Um, Chris, I'm sure we'll find a good place to put it. Um, thanks everyone. Um, keep looking for our emails and, um, and we'll see you again soon, I hope, and in, in the virtual space at least, but not in real. And Laura, and, you made a plug for the league in the beginning to join yes. us. Um, yeah, this I'll is do it a, again. This is an inclusive group. We are tilting at every windmill we can find. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> we need more hands on deck. Yes. So um, please, please join please us. Join. Yeah. Oh, and Katie and I are both members. Oh, yay. Great. <laughs> Great. All right, everyone. Have a good evening. All right. Thanks Thank for having so us. Thanks a lot, Mark.